Image Church, welcome, welcome. It's a joy to be in the house of God this morning. Welcome everybody online. We're so happy you've joined us. Um, Psalms 136 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. So let's just all lift our hands and just begin to open our mouth and welcome the Lord. So Jesus, we give you praise, we give you thanks. Let's just all lift a thanksgiving to Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. We welcome you, Lord. You're faithful, you're good. Thank you for your steadfast love, your faithful love for us, God. Wonderful Holy Spirit, we give you the praise. And we ask you to have your way in this place this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
going to fill this room this morning with an atmosphere of praise. You're so worthy, Lord.
yourself a shout of praise in this place for our risen Savior. Come on, we can do better than that. Can we give God our best praise in this moment? You're alive. You're alive. We declare Christ. Christ crucified.
straight from your heart is your name, Jesus.
fairest of ten thousands. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. You're worthy of every praise. You're worthy of every hand lifted up. You're worthy of every gaze of our heart. Jesus, you are worthy. We declare, we thank you that you are the worthy one. You're worthy of our lives, of everything. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Come on, let's together as a church, let's just thank the Lord. Come on, let's thank him with a holy sound. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your presence today. You are worthy, Lord. King of glory, in your precious, beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Man, I feel the joy of the Lord in this room this morning. I'm telling you, he's here. Why don't we take our seats, maybe tell somebody you love them. Nice to meet them, as well as let's thank our worship team up here. Come on, let's thank our worship team. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Amen. Well, we're going to worship with our finances. Now, why don't we welcome Raul as he makes his way up here. Come on, let's welcome Raul as he comes up and shares today. Hello, everyone. It is so good to be back. I spent the last uh, 10 days here, and it's just been, I feel like my heart is full, and um, I don't know if you remember last time I came, I said, anytime people ask me about Jesus' image, what I always say is that I don't know of anywhere else on the planet where the presence comes so consistently, and it's, it's still true. It's, the Lord just shows up here, and oh. We get the privilege to just honor and love on him and worship him and more so look like him. So uh, I just quickly want to uh, share a principle because I, you know, when it comes to giving, I just, um, if I specifically talk about generosity, it'll, it'll influence that part of your life. But if I share a principle with you, you could apply it to in many places. So uh, I'm going to read in... Matthew 9, 27. It says, And as Jesus passed from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it, on, be it done to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through, through all the district. I've, I've been, uh, the last month or so, I've been studying the Gospels and trying to see if there was any place in the Scriptures where Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you, without the person who is in need of a miracle um, taking some measure of action towards their faith. Does that make sense? So like these guys, they were, um, it says that they followed Jesus crying out loud, have mercy on a son of David. I, I, all of scripture from what I'm seeing, and I might have missed something, but there's a principle clearly in, from, from Genesis to Revelation that Faith requires a measure of action, right? I think sometimes we hear that, um, you know, righteousness isn't by works, and you can't get it by works, it's by faith, and that's 100% true. I would never take away from that. However, James does say that faith without deeds is dead. It's kind of like healing. Uh, you can't do anything, like, you can't take any action to get to necessarily get healed, but faith, it will heal you, right? So I would, I would ask you, if Jesus to you said to you today, be it unto you according to your faith, what would your life look like? When people look at your life lived, when nobody, like, 
when, when it's not just around church members or when it's your everyday life, the mundane of life, and Jesus said, let it be done according to your faith, what would your life look like? If you believe Jesus heals, but you're never praying for healing, your belief remains a mind construct, it's a structure. But belief and faith, they're not equals. Belief becomes faith via action. Does that make sense? There was the, in scripture, there's the, the paralytic where his friends brought him and the house was so packed that they took him to the roof and they lowered him through the, through the ceiling. And Jesus said, Jesus said, according to your faith, pick up your mat and go home. So faith, it absolutely requires action. It absolutely requires deeds. Because think of it this way. I'll, I'll try to, I'm going to try to make this as practical as I can. Um, if, you know, the richest person on the planet, I think it's Elon Musk now, if he came to you and gave you his credit card and he said, um, he said, I just want to pay for everything in your life. Here's my credit card. Do whatever you want. I guarantee you that you probably wouldn't be shopping at like Goodwill or something or Ross, you know. And you probably wouldn't be driving a used car, right? You, you know that there's power in this, in this credit card. In a similar manner, faith, faith operates in, in a similar manner. Is that when you have faith, it, your life requires to look different. Faith, faith forces your life to look different. People will be able to see what, not what you believe in, what you don't believe, but what you have faith in and what you don't have faith in. Does that make sense? And so when it comes to generosity and to giving, it's not just about our well-being and being able to pay for our bills and take care of our families, although that's, that is top priority because in Timothy, Paul says that he who doesn't take care of his family is worse off than an unbeliever. And so it's extremely important. But your generosity has the power to influence and to impact people who you give to. Because when it's done in faith, there's a grace relief, released on the action to bring transformation. And so when we're in a setting like this, giving to the church, I, I know I've said it before, but I think it's, it's just so important and it sounds awesome, is that tithing is not generosity, tithing is obedience. Right? And so when we're in a setting like this, if we, can't, if we can't measure to be obedient, there's no way that we'll be able to go the extra mile with somebody in generosity. And so I just wanna encourage you guys today, um, express your faith that when people see your life lived, that when you look at, you know, when you look at your bank statements at the end of the year, you're doing your taxes, you can say to yourself, that I know that I have faith that God is a provider. That he's generous, that he, that he loves a cheerful giver because he's always cheerful when he gives. And so I just wanna invite you and, and welcome you to, to give um, with that heart and that mindset where we're expressing our faith not just to the Lord and before all of heaven, but to ourselves, to the people around us, to our loved ones, that we truly do believe that God is a provider. And when we demonstrate our faith, grace through the Holy Spirit empowers the action to bring transformation. Amen? Yes. All right, so you can give uh, by texting the number on the screen. Um, and there, will there be envelopes? Yes, and then if you need like an envelope to give cash or check, um, the ushers will be uh, passing them out. Oh, and raise, sorry, raise your hand if you need one of those. All right, let me just quickly pray uh, for the offering and um, we'll close off. 
So Holy Spirit, I thank you for amazing grace. God, I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus to transform our hearts and our minds, that we would be known as a generous people, that we wouldn't give because we have to give, we wouldn't give because you told us to give, but we would give because we carry the generous heart of Jesus. And it's our desire to change the world through our generosity. So we thank you. God, I ask that you would bless every, every dollar bill that's given, God, that every, um, every heart that's giving in generosity and in faith, that it would be marked with the, with the kingdom and with the power of the gospel to not just influence our own lives, but to influence our circles, um, to influence the body of Christ, our cities and our regions and our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Michael's going to be preaching, but we just had some quick announcements that we wanted to share with you guys. Um, first, VBS, Vacation Bible School, if we have that, if we can put that on the screen. That is coming up very soon. Um, for all you parents, we had you in mind. We're going to do two weeks this time and not one. Um, yeah, and it's our children went. It's amazing what God does. Parents if you want to come. Celebrating. 
parents are still, I'm celebrating yeah. as well. Um, you can sign them up at jesusimagechurch.tv or text VBS to 321-320-8040. All the information is right there. Um, come to VBS. Our, the people who do the kids ministry, honestly, there's, there's nothing. Can we just give it up for them? Yes. They are amazing, and children's lives are being transformed every week here at church, and VBS is going to be really special. And tonight? Okay, tonight's a really special night. Um, So as many of you guys know, we are not meeting at Judah location anymore for Sunday night. We might as well just let you guys know. The reason is in the last two weeks, there have been two shootings, uh, one in in the same parking lot. Uh, thank God nobody was hurt. The Lord protected our students and all of you. That's why we canceled two Sundays ago. Um, and then actually, last Sunday night, another one took place behind the building. So there was some pressure on me. You know, it was such a real-time decision. But now I know we made the right decision. The Lord led us. And so that being said... Yes, so of course we were, you know, trusting the Lord, but kind of, you know, not freaking out, but freaking out in a Christian way with faith, Raul. Um, So we were thinking, what are we going to do? The Sunday nights, you know, God moves every Sunday night. God's moving here. We had no place to go. That's why we met here last Sunday night at Lake Brantley. And um, this is my dad's old building, OCC, that he built. And um, yeah. It's where Michael got saved as a 12-year-old boy and healed from mono. His whole not family. Mono. Not mono. Epstein Barr. That's Bar. even worse. Yeah. Sorry. I need to share my testimony more. That when your builds wife the faith even it. more. Okay. Epstein Barr, which is a he more was healed advanced. from uh, cold. That's right. Well, mono is not fun either. But yeah. um, he was healed from Epstein Barr at a 12 as a 12-year-old boy. His whole family got saved. And the fact that the Lord worked this out, the way he did, the timing of it all, it's been just one thing after another, and God is in control. I'm telling you, if I've seen anything in this season, um, God is in control. Can I just say one thing? Just to, This will hopefully build your faith. Michael had surgery. That was a season. Then I had surgery because I had skin cancer. They removed it. I'm cancer-free, thank the Lord. Um, <laughs> And when you go through things like that, you can get discouraged, right? Because we're people. And then that happened at Judah, and we were thinking, God, you have to come in and take control now. There, we don't know what to do. And right on time, Jesus came in, worked everything out. It's going to be holy. This land is sacred. It was dedicated to the Lord. We're so grateful for the pastors that are letting us use it. We will be there these next three Sunday nights, we'll still be here at Lake Brantley Sunday morning. We'll see what the Lord does. But come there, come in faith, come hungry. I'm telling you, it's holy ground there. Don't miss it. Yeah. Yep, love you. Um, we, the first time uh, OCC was mentioned in relationship to Jesus' image was like, I don't know, almost 10 years ago. And uh, maybe longer than that. It was on the market and uh, the, the people were like, yeah, you guys should go get that. And they gave us the price and I was like, we, are you crazy? <laughs> but obviously the Lord's done so much and we so honor Forest City for, that's the name of the church, for opening their doors to us. Um, and it came, as I said, at, at a perfect time. And so if you guys want to be part of a historic night, you all need to get here, yes. get there tonight. I know some of you don't go on Sunday nights um, because you come in the morning. And I understand that. You have families. Sunday nights are quite radical. And uh, I think they make some of you nervous. <laughs> I'm, but I'm believing for the day that this Sunday morning makes your friends nervous yeah. and you nervous too. <laughs> Uh, but if you were ever going to go and double dip, this would be the night. <laughs> you, you need to come tonight. You need to bring your friends. I'm telling you, that place, when I got saved in the late 80s and then throughout the 
90s. That place was like heaven on earth. Um, Pastor Benny will be there tonight. He's coming. It's just a very sacred time. And um, I kind of want to, this morning, kind of talk through the journey because it's your journey and it's your prophetic history. I think it's important that every house understands their prophetic history. This is our family. And so uh, you want to know your roots and you need to know why you are where you are right now and where we're going. Amen. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, but um, I'll just say this. uh, They are they are open to a much uh, longer term relationship with us. And so these next three weeks are pivotal. I want us to come in lowly serving um, uh, and and I want us to be the most meek honoring people they have ever encountered. Can we do that? That that will carry a lot of weight and it could end up being a major blessing for this church, for our Sunday morning, Sunday night, and just everybody involved. Amen? Um, So let's pray. You could help me there, bud. Why don't you just lift your hands to the Lord? Can you just begin praying in the Spirit for about 30 seconds? Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Pray. Yeah, just start ministering to the Lord. He'll come and settle right here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just keep blessing the Lord. Keep blessing the Lord. Keep blessing the Lord. Take another minute, come on. Pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost. Praise you. See, you don't want to teach the scriptures without that moisture. We'll keep blessing the Lord. Come on, take your authority as a priest and just minister to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Father, we thank you for the power of your word and for the moment we're in. Let your will be done. Your word says that you surround us like a shield with favor. And we thank you for that and claim it for this season and all of our lives, individually, our families, and this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise, would you? Take your Bibles to Genesis 15. I have to turn my hotspot off. My son is in a golf tournament and he is texting me real time scores. And if you want me to be any good for anything right now, (laughs) we don't want those scores popping up here. If he makes a bad score, uh, you might hear me scream, get behind me. (laughs) All right, Genesis 15, 1. I'm reading out of the New King James. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Hallelujah. 
your exceedingly great reward. I want to read that again. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding and great reward. This is following really the account of Abram and Melchizedek, or if you're from the South, Melchizedek, which is not the way you say it. It's Melchizedek. (laughs) They even get it wrong in Tulsa, where they think Jesus is coming back to. And in Dallas, the Bible Belt, they get it wrong there too. It's Melchizedek, so don't make fun of me. King of Salem, that's the king of peace, who brought bread and wine, the priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, anyways, that's chapter 14. We move into chapter 15 here, and you look at the opening few words of verse 1. It says, these things, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. If you read the New Testament properly, you'll discover in the most vital places, the word is not a combination of letters. To us, when we think of the word word, we think of a saying or a construct of letters. But it's very difficult for a grouping of letters to come unto you and then talk to you. Does that make sense? Have you ever been chased by the word dog? Like you've never had a word come unto you. And so this actually gives context, and you'll find this throughout the Old Testament. This gives context to why John opens John's gospel with, in the beginning was the word. What he's doing, he's saying every prophetic fulfillment, every prophetic speaking, every utterance that came from the prophets, the Psalms, and Moses, all of that combined now has skin, and he's standing in front of you. His name is Jesus. So when the word of the Lord comes unto the prophets in the Old Covenant, it is a person coming unto the prophets. And he actually comes, in verse 1, in a vision. So he uses the vision as the setting to come to Abram. It's kind of like Ezekiel. The Bible says, Ezekiel was taken by the locks of the hair, lifted up into the heavenly places, and there saw visions of God. And I always find it really humorous when people say, just stick with the Bible, forget the supernatural stuff. And my comment is all, always like, dude, have you read the Bible? I'm like, what is, what is up with you? That's a pretty intense and personal encounter right there, lifted by the hair, by God, into the heavenly places. But it's interesting that the scripture says, and there he saw visions of God. In that place, in that place of the Spirit. It's the same place that John the Revelator, John the Apostle, writes. It's the same place in the Spirit, I should say, that he's describing when he pens, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day in the book of Revelation. This is what I would submit to you, that there is a lot we don't see because we're not in the proper location. It says here that Ezekiel saw visions of God. That would imply that the visions were taking place, and if Ezekiel couldn't see them, that's his issue. God does open our eyes, no doubt about it. But you can blind yourself. One of the quickest ways, the two quickest ways to blind yourself is the hardness of heart 
and disbelief. And forgetfulness. Because Jesus connects the lack of faith in the disciples on the boat right after he multiplied bread and fish for thousands. They're freaking out that they don't have enough food to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is a good, it's a good hike. It's eight miles wide, which is pretty big. For if you've ever fished, you've ever gone eight miles you know, offshore to go catch whatever. It's glorious out there, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, just had a moment. But that's a long way. However, the Bible says Jesus walked to the middle of that lake to get to his disciples when the, when the storm began to stir the waters and he was on the mountain praying. And the Bible teaches that while he's praying, he saw them struggling in the middle of the lake. That's what the Bible means. Middle means middle in Greek and middle means me, middle in Hebrew and Aramaic and whatever else you'll speak. So middle means middle. That means he saw them from four miles away. You can't do that in the natural. He could see because of the place he lived in. He lived in the spirit. Now, to show his dominance as the one, listen carefully, as the one who caused land to form out of the water in Genesis 1, to, to reveal his dominance, he chose to walk upon the water for four miles. And it was his way of pointing back to the Jews and saying, I'm the God of Genesis 1. It's me. I'm right here. So, all of that being said, God, when he speaks to us, God speaks clearly. And the closer you get to the Lord, the more clearly he will speak to you. We see this with his relationship with Moses and the difference between his relationship with Moses and Aaron and Miriam. He said, I speak to you in basically similitudes or, or riddles and mysteries. He said, but with Moses, I speak face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. Come on his right. Somebody got it because I want that. I want that. And here you see the Lord actually tell the people, listen to this, that he's closer with Moses than he is to his brother and sister. And so it makes us much more comfortable to just have this like socialistic view of the kingdom. But in God's economy, he just doesn't roll like that. God is closer with certain people than he is with others. God has a, a more authentic friendship with certain people than he does with others. And the way he expresses that is by the clarity of communication. It's not to say you shouldn't rejoice if you get this parabolic dream that requires an unfolding, because we all start there. But that it's not like, for instance, if there's mystery and whatever, colors and some stuff I wonder, when I read dream books, I'm like, and I don't read them much, I've read like, Two paragraphs. But I'm like, where are you getting that? They'll be like, uh, you know, cars mean this. And I'm like, how do you know that? Like every time? They only mean that in heaven? How do you know? So the point is this. We should rejoice in all of these things, but never settle. We want God to speak to us as a man speaketh to his friend. The Bible says of Noah that Noah walked with God. What fellowship. What amazing fellowship to walk with God. How about Enoch? The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was no more because God took him. And that Hebrew word for took can mean in certain contexts the same uh, wording that would be expressed in a Hebrew wedding. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. It wasn't so much an escapism uh, environment. He wasn't just rescuing Enoch. He was taking him, marrying him early. 
So those are the examples that Christians should, 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 should burn for. So here, the person of the Lord shows up to Abram. And he makes a statement. He says, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Right after that, look at verse 2. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So here the promise of Isaac is released. How many of you have heard of Isaac? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. God tells Abram, I'm the reward. He starts the relationship there. It's me. And then out of his goodness, God basically promises Abram a miracle baby. Not basically, he does. He promises Abram a miracle child. And if you continue to read, God calls Abram to the table. And he asks Abram to kill his son. Listen carefully. The son that God promised him. And it's understandable to me why people would ask, why would you take something that you gave me? And in an immature place, we say things like this. God would never ask for it back because he gave it to you. For me, that was a you know, career I pursued in the game of golf. It was my passion, I still love it, but it was more than a passion. It was everything I did for 21 years of my life. And my reply to the Lord when he asked for it was, you can't take it. You gave it to me. And he said, that's exactly why I can take it. Now, in our stream, in the shoulders that we rub from a fellowship perspective that I enjoy rubbing shoulders with, we are so into influence that we actually think that we need the entirety of our arsenal to influence the world, and so we've deified influence. And we've minimized sacrifice. And sacrifice doesn't just mean working hard. Sacrifice actually means death. When you sacrifice something in the Bible, you weren't telling the little lamb to run faster and put in extra hours. You killed it. It was no more. So when we call Jesus the sacrificial lamb, we're not just saying he spent long days healing the sick. We're what we're saying primarily and foundationally is you're the one who comes to die. But when influence or influencers become the standard, what you actually end up doing is diminishing holiness and exalting impact. 
And, and you start buying the lie that my compromise is unto impact, therefore God blesses it. So you hear stuff, oh, you can't just stop doing that. God blessed you with that. You shouldn't stop doing that. You should if God asked for it. You want, let me say it like this. If you're going to carry something in your hand in this hour, you want it to be in resurrected form. Let me say it another way. You want to lay it down at the altar, and if God raises it and puts it back in your hand, then it's lethal and dangerous. But if you don't, then the weapons of your warfare are carnal. They're your weapons. Even your giftings need to get slaughtered. You say, well, no, they're, they're, they're without repentance. I'm not talking about an office or the gift of healing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your passions, our passions, even our promises from God. Now, some of us kill what God gave us just so we can hide. You know, if you're like me, this scene would freak you out. A bunch of people and people knowing who you are. None of it's super fun in the natural. But sometimes your assignment is the mechanism that God uses to take those things off of us that need to go. So... God asks for the Isaac that he promised. And it all points back to Genesis 15.1. I'm your reward. And God saw to it that that would be the posture of Abraham's heart. God wanted to know, am I really your reward? Because you received that word when I released it. I came unto you in a vision. I told you I was your reward. Here's a test. Is this registering? So God asked for Isaac because God had just spoken in verse, in verse 1, in Genesis 15, that he wanted to be Abraham's all in all. So that tells me something. Listen carefully. That God even refused to share Abraham with the blessing he was giving Abraham. Say that again. God refused to share Abraham with the blessing he gave Abraham. And what you'll find, and for the sake of time, I, I don't want to go there, but what you'll find is that when Abraham takes Isaac up the mountain, he tells his servants, we will be back. I'll say that one again. Six of you got it. When he took Isaac up the mountain, and, and may, I, may I remind you, Isaac carried wood up the mountain. Sound familiar? Jesus carried wood up Golgotha. And Abraham knew something of his covenant God. He's the God who raises the dead. He knew it. He knew something. He had touched something through fellowshipping with the Lord. Now, there's a little debate. I don't want to get into theological debate, but I have studied it. My opinion is that Melchizedek is a theophany. It's, it's a manifestation of the pre-incarnate son. My opinion. Don't stone me if you disagree. But it's my opinion. He comes with bread and wine. 
and he comes to bless Abram, and he's the king of peace, <laughs> of the God Most High. This preceded any temple culture or worship who has no genealogy. He's from the ancient past. I mean, gosh. You know, if you ask the kid in children's church, they go, that's Jesus. <laughs> we, just, we just can't get there. And he blesses Abram. Now here's the question. If Abram is God's best friend on the earth, and Hebrews teaches us that only the greater can bless the, less, the lesser. That means Melchizedek was greater than Abram. And Abram was God's best friend. We're talking about a serious figure here. Y'all figure it. I'm not going to tell you, but that's what I think, okay? He touches something in his fellowship with the Lord that convinces him you're a dead raiser. I don't know what he touched, but he found something in the Lord's character. He discovered something in the Lord's nature that taught him, no matter what I give you, I can never outgive you. Say this, Jesus, you raise the dead. Say it again, Jesus. Come on, out loud, you raise the dead. Say it again, Jesus, you raise the dead. Two more times, Jesus. You raise the dead. One more time. Jesus. You raise the dead. Now. Yeah. Now. When we were in bondage. And all of us were in bondage. Uh, for those of us who don't think we were before Jesus. That's proof of your bondage. You were in bondage. I was in bondage. When we were in bondage and the shame cycle was our life, the shame and condemnation cycle, where you were free for three days, did something stupid, came into church, especially if you were a PK and your parents preached their sermons at you. <laughs> you think I've been there. My dad's watching right now. Dad, you know it's true. You know you've done it. I'd be like, man, these sermons are so applicable to my life. But then it was like, <laughs> I'd say, mom, dad's preaching at me. She'd go, I know. I know. We're all in bondage and we live in that shame cycle that makes us feel like dirt. Does it not? And Jesus said that he who sins is a slave to it. Nobody enjoys the sense of slavery. So the Bible speaks as the, of, of the tongue being like the rudder of a great ship. Or being able to mind yourself, basically, is harder than taking a city. So to not be able to steward your members or your mind, it is slavery. And nobody enjoys that, hopefully, especially if they come into the light, they think they're enjoying it, and then it turns on them. And that's what hell will be like, by the way. That the demons that we serve are the demons that will torment us and turn on us. So you're stuck in this cycle and all of a sudden the Lord starts delivering you and you get rid of that shame and that conduct, or he gets rid of it, you can't. And he starts to take it away and you feel light, free, and something kicks in. The moment you come to Jesus, he imputes righteousness. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad you'll never have to stand before the throne as your own attorney? I am. You don't have to scrub the stain off, you, off of you, that the blood will cover you. Imagine that as the Father looks at you before the throne, he'll look through a red lens, the blood of his Son. Everyone here will have a hue of red, a deeper stain, the stain that removes our own afflictions 
that are self-induced, does he remove every stain? Yes and no. One remains, the stain of the blood. Gosh. Even his robe is dipped. It's amazing. And so you, you feel liberated, and that's what happens. You go from a slave to a child. Maybe we'll teach you this in Romans. And you, you're adopted. Part of the family of God, and you feel fantastic. And you gladly start t- giving away the stuff that caused the pain and shame, right? You know? Some of y'all emptied your closets of all those clothes. You know what I'm saying? And thank God you did. You know, you flush stuff down the toilet, whatever, and it felt good. You get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And you get baptized in water, and God takes the scalpel to the old man of condemnation. And you literally are amazed that you're worshiping in a traffic jam. Right? The air looks better. You're nice to people that you didn't want to look at. Your mom couldn't get you to make your bed. You're born again now. Now you're vacuuming. You're washing clothes. It's amazing. Because the Lord is lightening the load. And as wonderful as it feels, and it is wonderful, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. And because he's good, he's still got some stuff up his sleeve. You see, the Lord is the master of timing. So if when I got saved, tonight, tonight you'll be in the room where I'll be able to take you to the place I got born again and the place I got healed and back to the right, the place I got filled with the Spirit. Fell under the power of God, filled with the Spirit. The most glorious sounds coming out of my being that nobody coached me through. Old ladies with buns tried. Like, just do this, just copy my prayer language. I'm like, I'm not copying your prayer language. Give me a break, I want the real deal. They're like, just, just let it go. I'm like, give me a break. So I waited, took six months, but I got the real deal. I got the real deal. I didn't choose Crisco. Nope. Cold press, extra virgin, cloudy olive oil. The good stuff. Don't sell out. Right there. You'll see tonight. Right by the piano. Filled with the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful. But if God would have told me, I'm going to use you to plant a church one day. And the first one will be dead as a doornail in California. And I'm going to allow you to discover that you can't do it. That's going to take four years of your life. You're going to be so discouraged, you're going to have to pay people to stack chairs. Literally. One of our volunteers said, I can't stack chairs tonight unless you pay me. I'm like, that's not volunteering. (laughs) Every day, 1045, preaching. This train would come by. Right through San Juan Capistrano. Shake the building. The train would go right. We were meeting in this dome-like tent. And we started in a movie theater, and it was horrific. I remember trying to pray for the sick, and the preview for this demonic movie called The Omen that was released on 666 came up on the screen for my background music. And I remember going, God, he's playing in a wacky key. He's like, Bruh. And I looked back at our pianist, and he's like, I'm not doing it. And the whole preview, I said, Lord, deliver me. We started off with 400 people. It grew to 75 in three weeks. <laughs> and I used to tell people, we're a mega church. We're mega small. And this is a church for you. If you want to be a part of a church where nothing happens, this is the one. This is the one. You, do, you won't get saved here. You certainly won't get healed. I'm not even sure if God's here. But we're the, we're the church for you. 
And, and those experiences help craft why we do what we do today, yeah. how we do things. Because I've gone the other way. Yeah. Didn't work. It's horrible. And if God had told me that on that night in 1989 when I got saved and healed at OCC, there's no way I would have gone into the ministry. No way. If I knew the measure of pain that pastors walk through, it's not a matter of, are you in pain? The, really, the question is, how are you managing your constant pain? It is a consistent life. And the, the pastoring people is painful. Because you're dealing with different levels of maturity, thousands of people, and then you realize people are going to be people. And then you have to love the sheep. Do you know how precious all of you are to the Lord? You are very precious to Jesus. He loves his sheep. I mean, he, imagine, he asks Peter a question. When, when he restores Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know that I love you. And this is how Jesus ups the ante or, or instructs Peter to prove his love. Feed my sheep. Oh, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. So you, you are precious to Jesus. But a pastor walks through pain. And, and it's really about, uh, I'm not sure you ever have a season where you don't have an issue. What you can do is become a testimony that God is bigger than the issues. So if the Lord would have told me, oh, you're gonna you'll walk through believing me for this much money, I'd be like, I ain't doing that. You're gonna have to build a building during a, an economic crisis and, and floor it and, not, and move forward in the opposite nature of what the devil's trying to do in the nations. While he's tearing things down, you're gonna build a building in, for the glory of God. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have done that at 12. I'd say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to hit golf balls. Way easier. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> or, the, or the betrayal piece. It's like betrayal is yearly. Deep betrayal. So you're betrayed. How are you going to deal with that? What I'm saying is, is the Lord doesn't give it all to you in those early years or days. Because at that point, he's still offloading and you feel like you can just fly. Then the drum roll starts. And you pray something smart, but that requires a seatbelt. Are you ready? Lord, use my life. You have no idea what you're asking. It's why Paul told Timothy, lay hands on no man hastily. The context there was commissioning and ordination. So what we do today is, hey, come to my course. By the way, it's an e-course. I never get to meet you. I don't know if you're crazy. I don't know if you smoke crack between the Bible studies. Just sign up for my course. And at the end of it, after 90 days, 90 days, you can't even get a tomato plant to grow in 90 days. In 90 days, you get ordained. <laughs> it's hilarious. We have no idea what we're signing up for. And so we just shell them out like on a conveyor belt. Prophetess, whatever. This one, that one. Then it shows up on their business card. They can't even address you until they use their title. And it happened so quick. I have had people I know who we raised up. Within 90 days going to other environments, now they don't go anywhere without their title. 
After years, I go, what happened to you? What happened to you? Then you pray that prayer. Lord, use me. And this is what he says. Okay. You gave me your drugs. But I'm going to dig deeper now. Now give me your miracle. See, that's the deeper place. I, you gave me your depression. I took it. Now give me the blessing. Put it back. Put it back into the hands that gave it to you. Now, if you've ever touched him prior to that, you know he raises the dead. That's what he does. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where's your victory? He's a dead raiser. Don't you get it? Why do you think he raised Lazarus just before he went into the holy city on a colt? It's a prophetic declaration that the graves will open one day when he walks into the holy city and rules and reigns forever. That moment was a microcosm of the second coming. He had to raise Lazarus to proclaim he's the Messiah. He's coming back on a white horse. When he comes back, he will land on the Mount of Olives. It will split in two and he will go straight into the holy city. And when he does, graves will start breaking open. Actually, prior to that, they will meet him in the sky, those who've gone on to be with him, and those who are here on the earth will be transformed into his likeness, and when they see him, they shall be like him. He's a dead raiser. He's a death killer. Are you getting it? I'm about to slap somebody. <laughs> I'm going to slap myself. That's what he does. He's not average. Who else can sit up in a grave without Elijah breathing in to his nostrils? He didn't need him. He didn't need dead bones. He didn't need any help. He's the Lord of life. Resurrection and life. That's what he does. But he only raises... That which dies. You got it. You want to live? You got to die. So let me quickly, for the next 10 minutes, just share where we've been in the spirit as a church, as a people, as a family. Years ago, uh, right after... Uh, Billy Graham died. Uh, we were living in Reading. And um, I had grown up hearing that when Oral Roberts and Billy Graham dies, Jesse's dad used to tell us that it would release the, the greatest move of God in our nation. It sounded good to me. So the morning he died, my phone rang. It was Lou Engel. And Lou's like, he's gone, you know. And when Lou talks, like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, you lose a bar of signal because it's... <laughs> it, takes, it takes battery life and everything. <laughs> your phone. Just, you feel like your phone's growling at you in the best way. He's like, he's gone. And I'm like, I know. So... We basically got together and a meeting was called here in Orlando. Lou had received a word that the call would become this end. And basically invited us to be a collaboration 
along with, I think at the time, five, or five other people. And I said, I'm in. I felt like it was the Lord for sure. And so we had our first send here in Orlando. It was glorious, very special. It rained in the middle of the service. I'll never forget looking back at Jeremy and the crowd started singing, let it rain. And the Lord had told me, I think I told you this, in the locker room prior, ask me for rain when you take the platform. There wasn't a rain cloud in the sky. A meteorologist posted when we prayed it, this little green dot on the radar right over the stadium. And I just said, Lord, send your heavenly rain. And it just started to rain. Right after I said it. Yeah, it was wild. I've seen the wonders of God. And I'll be able to tell my kids about it. You need to see them too, so you can tell your kids about it. And so we gladly got on board with Lou, and then Andy, my friend Andy Bird, took a much needed leadership role at the send there, and it was great. And we went to Brazil and planned Kansas City, which happened uh, yesterday. But over the last few months, I felt the Lord speaking to me. And the Lord was basically saying, you need to focus on what's going on here in Orlando. And decrease your bandwidth, lighten your load, and be laser-like. And I really had no idea what was in store. I just heard him speaking. And leading a church and then having a wife and children requires a lot of time. Our kids are at the age where you feel like you're a full-time recreation director. <laughs> you know, it's like, gosh. Now I know I get the whole minivan thing. Like, I'm almost there. I'm like, I'll take one. <laughs> but I feel like an Uber, you know? It's a golf tournament, and volleyball camp, training, all this stuff. It's wonderful, but it's busy. So then I got counsel from... Uh, elders and our board and all we're saying you need to lock in you need to lock in to what God's doing here Jesus image and so I took it to the Lord about a month ago I said Lord I'm grateful for what they're saying but I need you to talk to me and, and I think the Lord was like I, they are talk, I am talking through the counsel of many but since you're so hard headed I'll work with you tonight so I laid down and went into a dream. And then in the dream, the Lord was very clear. It was a very difficult decision to see something birthed at, at its inception. You know, the natural man gets juiced with big crowds and all of that. Uh, it shouldn't feed the soul at all. But when we're not in the spirit, we let it feed our soul. Ministry conquest that is untethered to holiness and the voice of the Spirit and the Word is really dangerous. Because it's very confusing. You communicate to the public, and I'm not saying this is happening at the sin. I'm just saying it's possible, lifestyle-wise, to communicate that God is, God is happy just because God is moving. And the Bible doesn't teach that. So after my dream, I basically said I, I need to not come to KC and not be a collaborator anymore. It was very hard. One of the greatest offerings I've ever given the Lord. If not, I don't know, it's there. It's, it's way up there. And God is in it. And I believe in the mission of God's presence and mobilizing people to the nations. I believe in it. But God now all of a sudden interrupts me. And I could have easily said, but you gave it to me. But you see, I've walked that road before and I knew what he was doing. It was a love invitation. Because God and I made a covenant. Michael, I'm your exceeding and great reward. Now that's costly. That's got to mean something. And so I did. And some people were confused. They didn't understand. 
Obviously, Jesse is walking through or was walking through that uh, skin cancer. Thank God it's all gone. But I needed to be there for her this week. And God just lined it all up. There's no way I could have gone onto a platform in KC with my wife walking through what she's walking through. But the moment I laid it down, the moment something broke. Something broke. And I get a phone call from some, from some precious people in this church who said, hey, we think OCC might be open. Like that, in 48 hours? And I heard that gentle voice of the Lord go, you cannot give me. <laughs> and there's other stuff going on that maybe next week or the week after I'll tell you. But it's like we crossed over into this favorable wind. Land and facilities. and It was all hung up. It was all hung up and it just needed a little hole to break the dam. It just needed a little offering. And there's a lot of ways to look at events like that. I mean, you could go into it and go, this is my moment. It's time for Jesus and Mr. Shine. We just released an album. God doesn't think like that. This many faces. Maybe when I leave, I'll be an influencer. Wouldn't that be amazing? But do any of us here want to not influence heaven because we've chosen to influence men and women? My heart is so behind what this end is carrying. I love them. They're my dear friends. But I can only speak to my specific assignment. God said, put something dear to you on the altar. And I'm not sure we even realize what rests on the other side of this, this thing we call, obedience, we call obedience. I was talking to many of you here. You say, well, did it feel good? No, it hurt. A lot. But now I feel really good. Tonight, you're going to have to peel me off the floor. I may not leave. I may just sleep there. By the way, you have to leave by nine. It's part of the rules. But maybe I am allowed to just sleep there. Something's got to die for you to walk into your promised land. something and God can only trust us with what we're willing to release does that make sense to you and so to think that tonight we're going to walk into the building that Jesse's dad built that was a horse farm he jumped the fence which I would love to watch that. <laughs> Hop the fence in 1983. I think it was built in 84. In 1983, hopped the fence, claimed it for God. Walked into the lady's house on the horse farm and said, ma'am, I want to buy this property. Her sons were there and got mad. She told her sons to be quiet, I believe is the story. And she said, what are you going to do with the property? And he said, I'm going to build a church here. And she said, before my husband died, he said, the only building that's allowed to be here other than our family house is a church. Don't sell this to anybody but a pastor. And then the nation started coming because God lived there. Yes. And as of two weeks ago, or as of a week ago, we had no place to go on Sunday nights, and that has become a watering well for the nation. 
But this great peace came to my soul. Because I knew when I laid something dear to me down, he's the God who raises the dead. He's the God who raises the dead. What I'm talking about this morning is is full surrender. All in. All in. That's the Christian life. All in. with every head bowed and eye closed, all in. The reason you struggle in sin is because you're carrying it. Somebody asked Benny Johnson one time, I just need to find peace. And she said, well, where'd you put it? Just right there, wait on the Lord with your eyes closed. What are you holding on to? Is it your own life? Are you you hooked on your own plans? It really means that you're the Lord of your life. Jesus wants everything, 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 everything. That which pains you and even that which brings you pleasure that you know you're holding back from him. Because he's saying to you this morning, I'm your exceedingly great reward. And he's spoken that to you and now he's calling us all, all of us, me included, to the table. And he's saying, I want the core of your being. I want the entirety of your life. With every head bowed and eye closed, you say, Michael, I got to give him everything this morning, everything. I'm t- I, mean, I even mean Relationships. Relationships that are bringing sin your way. I don't care how much you think you love that person. You need to love Jesus more. If that's you this morning, this might be your first time or a recommitment and a fresh surrender. I want you to lift your hand. You say, Michael, I need that. I want everyone to stand, please. Listen to me. If you raise your hand, or you wish you did. Maybe you brought someone this morning. Maybe you brought someone this morning and you know the life they're living. I want you to look at them right now and say, come on, today's your day. If there's any doubt in your mind, I want you to do the work of an evangelist right now. The hour is too late. It's too serious. Say, come on. If you raised your hand or you wish you did, I want you to get down here right now. Many of you raise your hand. Don't hesitate. Just come on down. Come on down. I want our team to be ready to receive them. This is precious. And this is how you come alive. This is how you come alive, right here. Oh, come on. Give the Lord praise. Church, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Full surrender. Teams, would you come out front row? This is so precious. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to say something to the crowd before I pray. When the Lord asked, for, at the time, which was my passion, the game of golf. When he asked for it, after all the wrestling and the negotiating, when I gave it to him, I felt the, this flooding of his love and his peace. And I heard this gentle whisper from Jesus. 
This is what he said to me. Why did you wait so long? What he was saying is, isn't this reward, my presence? It doesn't it overwhelm what you thought was so sacrificial? And that's what I want to say to you in the crowd this morning. Let go of your life. Let go of it and give it to Jesus. And I'm going to begin praying for those who've come forward. But as I begin praying, if you feel you need to come, you just you come down. This is a safe place. This is a place to walk into and yield to the love of God. And let him be your exceedingly great reward. Let's pray. Let's pray out loud. You know what? I, I just felt this in my heart. I feel like there's a few of you in here who received very specific prophetic words at when you were young. Some of you younger. And that actually caused you to run. Not the word, your reaction to it caused you to run because it wasn't the life you chose. Maybe it came from your parents or your pastor and it just felt heavy and you didn't, you didn't want that for your life. I feel like God wants to redeem the time. And if that's you in this room, I want you to come down as well. You say, I, I do have amazing prophetic utterance that I've run from chosen my own way you come down thank you Lord remember you never have to do it the Lord will do it and if you ran from it because you thought you had to accomplish it it's always been the Lord it's not by might it's not by power it's by my spirit Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Let's all pray, guys. Would you stretch your hands towards these precious people? Father, say this out loud. Father, I've run too long. And today, I yield my life. I submit my life to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I repent of my sin. I no longer want to be the Lord of my life. You are the Lord of my life. And so today, Jesus, I confess my sin, forgive my sins, Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I declare that Jesus Christ is the Holy Son of God, born of the Virgin, lived a perfect and holy life, shed his blood, and died on the cross to pay for my sin. I declare that Jesus Christ was buried and raised again as the King of glory, as the Son of the living God. Jesus, you ascended to the right hand of the Father, and today you are seated, ruling and reigning over the entire universe heaven and now you rule and reign over me I repent Lord Jesus receive me I lay it down you are the God who raises the dead raise my life and raise my destiny in you in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Now, I want you to stay where you are.
I think, not I think, I know that what wears us down as we follow the Lord is when we try to do it on our own. And the promise of the Holy Spirit is not that. It's so that He will do it. And so I want you just there on the ground, you're on there on your knees, just lift your hands to the Lord. And I'm going to pray that the one who promised our Father, the one who promised the Holy Spirit, God our Father, as I ask Him that His Holy Son Jesus will baptize all of you afresh in the Spirit and carry you and animate you and invigorate you and energize you so that he gets all the glory. Church, would you pray just for a moment for these precious people? And you receive it too. You receive it too. Father, you told us through Jesus that we were to ask, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so right now, Father, I ask as their pastor, I ask even for myself, send the Holy Spirit to fill us, to cleanse us, to carry us. It's not by my, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Receive this morning the precious person of the Holy Spirit the empowering of the Holy Spirit no more work on your own may you get all the glory here Lord you do it you do it in Jesus name in Jesus name amen can we give the Lord praise now, for those of you who came forward, did we get those pamphlets in yet? I want everyone to get one. For those of you who've come forward, I want all of you, if you haven't already, to go to the New Believers table. This is the way we stay in touch with you. We want to see disciples made. This booklet that's being handed out, it's, it's an amazing booklet. It's loaded with scriptural content. Take it and read through it and let us walk with you. It would be our honor to do that. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, clothe your precious people. Thank you for your work and your word. Let tonight be a night from heaven. Come on, agree with me. Let tonight be a night from heaven. Let us step in to what you're saying and doing. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all. See you tonight. God bless you. Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing, and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're going to show you right now. 
I want to take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County, right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus Image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10:42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for His presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious, 
with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May He be adored and worshiped on this property. May His Word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May His gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find Him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.